We all know that April 5th, 2063 is when Earth made first contact with the Vulcans, or should I say Vulcans made first contact with the humans. Now that doesn't sound right, because in the context of this article, it absolutely isn't the first contact between humanity and aliens, because that actually happened quite a few times throughout history. With that in mind, I'm Sean Ferrick for Trek Culture, and here are 10 alien encounters before first contact. Number 10, the Greek gods who mourns for Adonai. In the now infamous scene, the Enterprise is flying along minding its own business, but a big giant green hand reaches out of space and grabs it, stopping it dead. This was sent by Apollo, the last corporeal member of the race of aliens who made contact with Earth in roughly 2700 BC. These aliens, the natives of Pollux IV, they were nourished by love and adoration in the same way that humans are nourished by food. Ironically, they initially appeared mostly human, except for, as was noted by Dr. McCoy, an additional organ in their chest. This organ allowed them to have power over such things as the physical manifestation of themselves, the weather, and other such hmm, telekinetic energies. They ruled over the Hellenic region of Earth until, effectively, humanity outgrew them. Unable to deal with being forgotten, they returned home to Pollux IV, where all but Apollo surrendered their physical forms and became non-corporeal entities. Apollo held out the longest, believing that he could find more followers to worship him, but as he discovered when the Enterprise crew arrived on the planet, there really wasn't a place for him anymore. He threw his hands up in the air and asked his fellow gods to accept him as another non-corporeal being, which they said yes to. Number nine, Quinn, Death Wish. The Q are ageless, omnipotent beings who generally like to remain above it all, by which we mean they like to sit on dusty roads and get really, really bored. Well, until they're having a civil war, but that's a whole other thing. In fact, they had done everything and seen everything that they were their own monuments to their own advancement until Quinn was released from his prison. This errant Q had been shoved inside a rock for his own good. I, he started talking about wanting to kill himself. They thought that the best way of dealing with this was keeping him away from other members of the Continuum. He had also taken very direct movements toward influencing history, particularly human history. At his trial aboard Voyager, when he asked for asylum, three witnesses were summoned to speak on his impact on history. Sir Isaac Newton was one of the witnesses who recognised Quinn as the man who jostled the tree on the day he invented Mavity. So it was Quinn who ushered in a new era of understanding in human history. Maury Ginsburg was a, a friendly hippie who Quinn gave a lift to on the way to Woodstock because his own car had broken down. Without him, they would never have discovered a technical failure, which means Woodstock wouldn't have gone ahead. And last but not least, you had William T. Riker, who himself didn't initially recognize Quinn until shown a picture of his own grandfather standing beside, you guessed it, Quinn. Quinn had saved his life and therefore ensured that Riker was born, thus saving humanity from the Borg. The Q used these examples as to why Quinn should remain alive, because he had had such positive impact on all of human history. However, Janeway eventually did agree to give Quinn asylum, which set, in turn, the events that led to his death. Number eight, the Briori, the 37s. The Briori have never actually appeared on screen in Star Trek, but their presence was very strongly felt across all of human history, particularly of the 20th century, and was shown in the episode The 37s. In the Delta Quadrant, Voyager encountered a planet whereupon frozen humans were found, including Amelia Earhart. You see, the Briori had visited Earth in the mid 20th century, kidnapping around 300 humans to transport back to the Delta Quadrant to be used as slave labour. Of the humans that were not kept in stasis, the rest of them rose up and eventually overthrew the Briori, stealing their technology in the process. This allowed a colony of humans to start to grow in the Delta Quadrant, so that when Voyager arrived in the late 24th century, they found a fully sustainable human colony. There was a serious choice then of should Voyager remain here? But as this would have meant abandoning the search to get home, they decided to move on, leaving those humans by their choice behind. Number seven, the preservers, the paradise syndrome. 
The Preservers were a peaceful people who travelled through the galaxy, effectively saving civilizations that they felt were on the brink of annihilation. The Federation discovered this when they visited the planet of Amorind, a planet many light years away from Earth, only to discover indigenous American tribes existing there. Spock was able to discover via a preserver obelisk that had been left behind as protection on the planet that several different tribes of indigenous Americans had been rescued by the preservers and brought here so that they may continue their way of life. Though the preservers themselves have not made an appearance in Star Trek, writer Ronald D. Moore established that he imagined the progenitors, i.e. the alien that was discovered in the episode The Chase of the Next Generation, were, at least in his mind, the preservers. Now, the timeline of this gets a bit muddy when you think that they were said to have been gone for billions of years, but the preservers would have had to have been traveling through the Milky Way galaxy at least within the last let's say 20,000 years. The obelisk that was left behind was there to protect the planet from impacts by meteoroids and asteroids. There was another one, in fact, on one of the moons of Andoria. Number six, the Zindi Carpenter Street. While this episode almost served to encourage Jeffrey Dean Morgan to think of a different career path other than acting, this example serves as one of the less pleasant early alien encounters on Earth. The Zindi reptilian faction had, with a little help from the Sphere Builders, been experimenting with biological weapons. For this to properly work, they needed human subjects to test on, so they employed a 21st century human, played by returning actor Leland Orzer, who was playing Loomis to help kidnap victims for them to work on. He worked with a blood bank and initially he didn't realise that he was working with aliens. Although as the episode progressed and Lieutenant Daniels was able to send Archer and T'Pol back in time to help stop these incursions, Loomis did become aware that his benefactor wasn't exactly looking like you and me. The end of the episode did see Loomis arrested for his actions, but he did retain knowledge of these Zindi soldiers and was raving about these reptilians to the police who, naturally, in the context of the 21st century, thought him to be a bit of a loon. Number five, the Davidians times Arrow. The Davidians were time-traveling aliens who fed on the neural energy of their victims, much in the same way that we would eat food. They were none too discerning about who their victims were, and their feedings were almost exclusively fatal. They travelled back to San Francisco in the 19th century and there, amid a cholera epidemic, were able to disguise their actions as people were simply dying around them anyway. In a fun predestination paradox, the discovery of Lieutenant Commander Data's head in a cavern in the 24th century San Francisco set in action a chain of events that saw the bridge crew of the Enterprise D go back in time to San Francisco, encounter these Davidians, and ultimately, with the help of Guinan and Samuel Clemens, stop these incursions from happening. The time loop was locked into place as Data was decapitated in the 19th century, although his body was returned to the 24th century with his head remaining behind. His head from the 24th century was then attached to the body from the 19th century, Clemens, who'd travelled through time, went back to where he was supposed to be. Picard got home just in time to survive a volley of torpedoes, beam up to the Enterprise-D and have a very knowing smile with a contemporary Guinan. Number four, the Vulcan's Carbon Creek. Was this just a tall tale told by T'Pol to tease Trip Tucker, or was this actually one of the first contacts between Vulcans and humans almost a full century before they were meant to? A Vulcan survey ship was damaged in orbit of Earth in the late 1950s. They found a place to crash land, although several of their crew were killed in that landing. They vaporized the bodies, but realized quickly that they would have to interact with humanity before they all starved to death. I've made no secret of the fact that Carbon Creek is one of my favorite episodes, particularly of Enterprise. Jolene Blaylock is brilliant as Tamir, and returning actor J. Paul Boomer is absolutely brilliant as Mestrel, the Vulcan who becomes so enamored with 1950s culture, he elects to stay behind when a rescue ship arrives. They had a massive impact on humanity. I mean, they invented Velcro and gave it to us, so thanks for that. But also, I love the fact that Mestrel just falls in love with... I love Lucy. One thing that we're still not quite sure about is, did Mestrel see through on his promise of effectively vaporizing himself before he died so that 
they wouldn't find the body of a Vulcan on Earth a long time before it was supposed to be there. I choose to look at this as more of a funny conundrum as opposed to an incredibly grim fate for the man. Number three, Onaya, the muse. Onaya appears as a beautiful woman when she arrives on Deep Space Nine. She quickly zeroes in on Jake Sisko, sensing the boy's creative genius. This is something she's got down to a T, because it's not the first or even the tenth time that she's got to know a human in this way. Anaya boasts about helping to inspire some of the greatest writers in history, such as Keats or Catullus. This makes her a lot older than she appears to be. John Keats lived in the 18th century, where Catullus lived in the first century BC. Anaya is something of an enigma, because she certainly is feeding on these artists. But at the same time, she absolutely is helping them to create their best and greatest works. While her influence almost kills Jake, it does allow him to effectively complete his first novel, Anselm. She definitely did help both Keats and Catullus complete their literary output, but maybe let's not use that as the argument when Ben Sisko's standing in front of her, phaser in hand, while his son bleeds on her lap. Number two, Sky Spirits Tattoo. The Sky Spirits were a race of Delta Quadrant aliens who visited Earth some 43 thousand years before Voyager found their homeworld. When they first encountered Earth, they met a group of nomadic people who had no spoken language, but it was these people's love of the natural planet that endeared them to the Sky Spirits. These aliens were technologically advanced, but their technology worked in tandem with the natural world so that it was never costing the natural world anything. They also had the ability to imprint a genetic memory on people so that generations later they would still be remembered. As human civilizations grew, these inheritors, as they came to be known, were slowly wiped out. Not all of them, however, were. Even though when the Sky Spirits next encountered humanity, they believed their friends were all dead. Thankfully, Chakotay, himself a descendant of the Rubber Tree people, was able to convince them that though the numbers had dwindled, not all of their friends had been killed thus ushering in a new era of communication between both humans and the Sky Spirits. Number one, Vulcan on a bus, Star Trek IV, the one with the whales. It's a foregone conclusion that none of these people have ever seen an extraterrestrial before. Well, as this video has proven, that statement's debatable. Having said that, the crew of the HMS Bounty definitely shook things up when they landed their cloaked ship in Golden Gate Park in the 1980s. Though Spock had the wherewithal to cover his Vulcan eyebrows and ears, he couldn't mask his inherent Vulcan nature. There was little run-ins, such as his speech pattern. If we were to assume that those whales are ours to do with as we please, we would be as guilty as those who caused their extinction. I mean, you could maybe not talk like that right in front of a 20th century woman. You could maybe not mind meld with a whale in front of an entire aquarium full of people, Spock. One moment where his Vulcan nature did benefit everyone was when they were on the bus. Sitting directly across from Kirk and Spock is a punk who would like to listen to his music really quite loud. Admiral Kirk does ask him to turn it down. Mm -mm. He asks him politely again to turn it down. To this, the punk gives Kirk the finger. In answer to this, Spock gives him five fingers of his own, leans across the bus and gives him a nerve pinch that's so accurate it causes the punk to fall forward, thus hitting the stop button on his boombox. This one encounter, such a throwaway moment in history, certainly had an impact on the young punk. When Seven of Nine and Raffi are riding the bus in LA some 40 years later, that same punk is there, this time knowing when to say when after Seven asks him to turn the music off. That's everything for this list, folks. What do you think? Are there more? I think there definitely are. Reckon we can do a second list on this? I think we will. So we will keep you abreast of that one. Make sure that you're following us over on Twitter, on Blue Sky and TikTok at Trek Culture. Make sure that you're following us on Instagram at Trek Culture YT as well. I am at Sean Ferrick. You look after yourself until I see you again. Make sure that you live long and prosper. To all of our friends out there, have a good day year. I think we're still early enough in the year that I can say that. You're awesome. You're wonderful. I'll see you soon.